Good afternoon, it's Tuesday the 12th of January 2016, just after one o'clock. Um, welcome to UK Column News. In the studio is Mike Robinson, deeply behind the technical desk. Now we've got quite a busy news, bear with us today. Uh, it's been quite uh, interesting getting prepared, but uh, shortly we'll be going live with Steve, who together with Mike will be talking about uh, the Upton fracking camp and what's been happening there. Before we start with that, a few words on the weather. Pretty cold, wet, showery in Plymouth, and that seems to be reflected across the country. Uh, I understand that it's also wet and wind windy in Pembrokeshire. So those uh, corgis are definitely going to need their coats. Uh, we've also got an update on uh, Tom Crawford's uh, court case. That's the Crawford 7, as we're calling them. There's some good news there. And the rest of our news today will be, will be uh, covering events uh, across the country. Mike, how are we doing? Uh, well, so the Upton uh, camp eviction is happening as we speak, or at least they're trying to. And I'm joined by Steve Spy. Steve, are you there? Uh, yeah, I'm on the top of the tower on the site. Uh, we've got bailiffs running uh, all over the place. Uh, we've got multiple lock-ons. We've got people in tunnels. Uh, they've got the work cut out. Uh, so I'm looking down on them from the, uh, the tallest point on, uh, on, on the camp, uh, and they are uh, slowly moving through. Uh, they've made a pig's ear of bringing out a, a cherry pick onto the site. They've got a JCB yeah, well, unit. Actually, we've got a that. photograph of that, Steve. If we, if we roll through a couple of the pictures, uh, first okay. of all, uh, we've we've got a picture of the police uh, outside, and I noticed on your live stream earlier that uh, the you, you were suggesting they have uh, people uh, qualified for moving underground as well. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, they've, uh, they've got one that like, guy. He's, uh, he's just got kicked out in divers equipment and that, and uh, they, they're basically trying to get down one of one of our tunnels. Right, and how many tunnels are there? Uh, in total, there's about five, five tunnels, all uh, you know, in, in, in individual sort of sections, and that all going up on different things. We've had two years to prepare the site, so uh, uh, there's, there's quite a network. Uh, they've not found all of the tunnels yet, uh, so I don't want to disclose too much on that. Sure, sure. Uh, but uh, clearly, this must be costing a fortune. Uh, yeah, it's specialist teams that they've brought in to do this, uh, climbing people, caving people, uh, um, the, the, the police are ringing the whole field, uh, so just on, on, a, on a police budget alone, it's, it's huge. Uh, the, the helicopter's been used, uh, so yeah, there's, there's, quite, uh, there's, there's quite an expense uh, going into that. Um, okay, and we do actually uh, have an image of the cherry picker, and they, they did try to bring this into the field, and it basically sank. Uh, yeah, it's ridiculous. It's far too heavy for this. Uh, so it's totally waterlogged the field, so it's uh, it's not a kit, and it's, it's just uh, sat there now. It's going nowhere. Um, so I think they're just planning now. They've been sat scratching their heads for quite a while. Uh, we're just waiting for them to move into uh, our position there, where we'll uh, we'll lock on and try and just hold out as long as possible. Brilliant. And of course, every every minute that you uh, you hold out, uh, it's costing them quite a bit of money. Yeah, well, obviously we just we just want to hold up the uh, the whole fracking process. The uh, uh, we can't let one hole go into the ground. Uh, this, this, this process will keep, kill people, uh, and in this case, we've got testing around. It's absolutely nonsense to, uh, to try and uh, do a drill and, and contaminate this water aquifer here. Yeah, uh, Steve, can you hear me, it's, uh, Brian Gerrish? Yeah, yeah uh, Steve. I can hear you. Hello there. Well, well done to all of you. Can you can you just tell our uh, viewers and listeners what sort of what is the mood amongst the police? Are, are you managing to have sensible conversations with them, or are they in there? Yeah, the, 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 the police are taking a step back on this one. Like they've got liaisons running around. Uh, they're all smiles and happy. Like there's, uh, there's no issues with the police. Uh, they're just leaving it up to the, the bailiffs who uh, are, are making very sl sl slow progress in in, in shifting uh, the people off there. Uh, some of the stuff that they've got to cut through a, a massive uh, uh, chunks of concrete. Uh, it's going to take some hours for them to do that. And obviously uh, uh, there's us at the top of the tower, which they'll uh, have to think about shifting. Right. Uh, well, we'll be saying a bit more about bailiffs uh, in just a few moments, uh, because, of course, bailiffs and how they operate is coming more and more to the fore and has been one of the key parts of the Tom Crawford mortgage eviction case. Um, OK. And what about local officials? Have you had any people from local councillors turn up or 
people from the local authority? Well, Matt, Matt, our local councillor there, um, he turned up and uh, he was he was moved away. They've uh, uh, they've been shoving the press out of the way. They've uh, you know they, uh, I think we they, they really want peace and quiet to, to, to move in and, and sort of conduct their exercise on 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 the field. Okay, that's a good point. What what about press coverage? Has there been any mainstream or local press? Well, that's the BBC down ITV, like we are uh, on on mainstream television. The one show was uh, supposed to be coming down today and, and doing a, a section, so uh, so I believe they're coming down. Um, I can just see in the far field now that uh, people off uh, an area of land. It's nothing to do with this field, but they they can see where we uh, us where we are and they can stream from there, uh, and they've been moved away now by a bailiff. Right. Okay, and can you tell us the name of the bailiff's firm? Do you know it? It's UK Evict. UK uh, Evict? It's a, yes, it's a specialist firm that they use for this type of uh, uh, exercise to, to uh, evict, evict people from protest sites. Uh, obviously, a very expensive uh, team. Uh, that, that, uh, um, you know, obviously, I, I, I guess, must have loads of money to bandy around because they're spending a fortune on this eviction. Uh, right, okay. And... <laughs> Do you have any message? Is there anything you'd like to say to the wider public? You're there at the top of the tower. You're protesting about the dangers of fracking and the damage it can do. Uh, you can't let uh, the industry get a foothold in this country. It's important that we stop it now. Uh, and and we're, we're putting ourselves in harm's way, you know, a, you know, a personal risk to try and get the message out to the wider public. They're going to be doing this up and down the country. Everybody needs to get out in the local areas and don't let them get any holes in the ground. It's absolute madness. Uh, it, will kill, it will kill a lot of people. OK, Steve, thank you very much for that very good report and uh, we'll be happy to uh, broadcast more as, as um, events unfold with you. And uh, OK, thank you for that. Obviously, that's a key comment, uh, the dangers of fracking. Ian Crane and all those activists, as uh, you've just heard Steve say, putting themselves at risk, trying to stop huge environmental damage and also risk to the health of the population. Um, don't just take our reports, um, investigate yourself and uh, research yourself about the dangers of fracking. Uh, well, let's just move on to uh, good news. And that is we've got a result which came in about an hour ago to the Tom Crawford uh, court case. This is where supporters of Tom Crawford, including, including his son, had been in court for some eight days, um, basically uh, they'd gone back into Tom's repossessed property and although uh, they were quiet and well behaved and simply providing food to people, they're arrested uh, essentially for a fray and um, that goes to a um, jury trial. Well, this is the news um, that after eight days, all of them, that seven accused, have been found not guilty. The case has been dropped and costs have been awarded to the accused. Now, there were some quite remarkable things came out during this trial. Uh, that this is the number one key point, that no signed warrant was ever produced in court. Uh, this is fundamental to the whole case. The whole taking the repossession of uh, Tom Crawford's house was done from the outset without any signed warrant. So this is the bailiffs acting essentially outside authority and it appears that the court um, i'm going to say the court staff were adamant uh, that no uh, warrant was going to be produced in court because it was admitted in court there was no signed warrant i'll just add a couple of uh, other points there mike to that slide if i may uh, we've also got uh, that no supporting documents in relation to the warrant were produced these are the provenance documents. Obviously, there has to be an application for a warrant. Uh, so if you claim you have a warrant, there must be the supporting document which shows the trail, who requested it um, and who, who signed it off. None of that was produced at all. Two of the defendants held a no plea, no case to answer stance. Uh, this was very important because at one stage the judge Fowler attempted to bully them into making a not guilty plea. They said, no, we're making no plea because there is no case to answer. 
and uh, it took some courage for them to uh, keep to that stance. And then basically four of the defendants successfully represented themselves. Three had barristers, four successfully represented themselves. And as Guy Taylor said to me this morning, what this proves is that uh, people who do the research have got the courage to go into court um, and understand the basic procedures can successfully uh, defend themselves, particularly where there is uh, corruption and criminal action within the uh, judicial process itself. We've come back to no signed warrant, so no document upon which to base the repossession of the house. And the last point is that uh, the judge uh, for several days was saying, um, I'm really not sure why this uh, trial is taking place, because even if uh, the defendants are found guilty, what are we going to do with them? It's going to be a very minor, uh, a minor sentence. After eight days at huge cost to the taxpayer, thousands, tens and tens of thousands of pounds, um, no surprise, not guilty, and the case dropped. Um, what does this show? Well, it shows that the truth about mortgage fraud, corruption within the courts is coming to the surface. And it's also showing that where people stick together, do their homework, prepare properly for these court cases, they can win. Now, I believe that we should have Justin Walker um, waiting on the Skype line. So, Justin, if we can bring you in, perhaps you might like to comment on that Tom Crawford case, if you could hear everything uh, I've reported. Ab absolutely excellent news, uh, but it just shows what happens when the system uh, is shown up for what it is. And, uh, you know, well done to the judge. I think some of these judges and people like that are now starting to realise they are defending the indefensible. And it wouldn't surprise me if some of them are not actually saying, OK, I'm going to go with this because we know which way the wind's blowing. And I think you're going to find senior members of the judiciary and people like that will be coming onto our side, which at the end of the day is the side of truth. It's as simple as that. We are the ones who are exposing the system, which is a thoroughly fraudulent and corrupt system that has been evolved over the years, over the centuries, and good people are now are unraveling it. So I think it's excellent news and well done. Um, thank you for that, uh, Justin. It's also going to be very interesting to see what the mainstream media makes of it, because uh, there, there was an ITN uh, reporter is just one who's been present through the case uh, and of course uh, all of the members of the public present who are aware of the case were filling him full of information about why the documentation is significant so it could just be that even if there's no public statement by mainstream the the truth is burrowing its way back into their organizations but Justin, you were keen to come and talk to us today on the subject of the Swiss alternative currency, which we mentioned a few yes. days ago. Now, uh, I'm, yeah, right. Well, I'm going to slightly change things, if I may, because I've just been given a startling stop press, which I've sent you guys. But obviously, with what's happening with the fracking camp and everything else, uh, the head of RBS is telling everyone to sell, 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 mining shares, oil, the lot. The panic has started. Now, I feel a bit like, if you know your history, when the Germans attacked uh, the low countries in France, they attacked on May the 10th, 1940. Well, I feel today is a bit like May the 9th. That is, something is building, it's building fast, and we've got to start to really get the message out strong and hard. Now, I was sent some information yesterday. I don't know if you're going to cover this already, but it says here, um, I'm going to have to read it here, historic first, North Atlantic empty of cargo ships in transit, all anchored along coasts, none moving. Now, um, along with can, this can I just flash... make a comment about yes. that, Justin? Yes, okay. Uh, yeah. well, well, basically, that article was very interesting as far as it went. Um, but, uh, in fact, it's not totally accurate. Uh, right. now, it is fair to say that the Baltic Dry Index, which is the main uh, sort of measure of how much trade is being, or how much uh, container traffic is going uh, across the oceans, is at an all-time record low. That is correct. Right. Uh, and it is fair to say that if you look at the uh, 
the breadth and the depth of the high street sales that we've got on at the moment, it's pretty clear that retailers yeah. are not shifting product. Um, and so all the general points that are made in that article are absolutely valid. Uh, but I think their their comment, their specific comment about the fact that there's nothing moving in the oceans isn't quite right. There is, but it's significantly reduced, let's put it that way. Yeah, uh, well, I, I will concur with that. I mean, but I, as I said, it did come from a, a credible source. Uh, so that's why I've obviously brought it on today. But I, I did send you guys only just before the show started because I was only alerted to this email from the, about the RBS from my contacts. Uh, so if you can, perhaps, I don't know, before the end of the program, you may be able to salvage it, I don't know. But certainly it does sound very worrying when the head of finance or the head of credit control at the RBS is basically telling people to sell, sell, sell. So we are getting the signs that something is building. Uh, we have the conference at Davos, I think it's only a week away or two weeks away. So I'm, I'm just very uneasy the way things are, but we'll come back to that and we'll get back to what we're talking about in Switzerland and so forth. Um, yes, now, you, you, last week you touched with Alec the, the, the idea that the Swiss uh, National Bank um, was going to, there's going to be a referendum by the, this organization that's been set up to encourage the Swiss National Bank to issue debt-free, interest-free money on behalf of the Swiss government. Now, I'd just like to make two points. First of all, the, it's a Swiss National Bank, yes, but it is still signed up to the central banking system, so the national part doesn't really come into it. It is very much a fully paid member of the Bank for International Settlements. And obviously the Swiss is notorious for being uh, a secretive banking country where people can have private Swiss bank accounts and so forth. The Swiss, bank, the Swiss National Bank will certainly know all about what the Bank for International Settlement is really about. Uh, and it's just surprising that the Swiss have a treasury just like ours. I haven't got the name in front of me, but it, it, it is equivalent to a Swiss treasury. And the real solution, as we know with the Bradbury and the greenback dollar uh, uh, so forth, is for the treasury of the Swiss government to issue and control debt-free, interest-free money that's based on the wealth and potential of the Swiss nation. Now, this campaign that has achieved over 100,000 signatures um, came about because of positive money in the UK. Now, positive money, for those who don't know, uh, has been around about now for about three or four years, and they've been advocating that the, basically they, they acknowledge that money is created by the bankers out of thin air as debt, and that is wrong, and hats off to them. They have certainly raised the profile of showing people that the money only 3% is created by the Bank of England as currency. The rest is created out of thin air by the private banking cartel. So hats off to them on that. But right from the outset, when we got to hear about the Bradbury Pound and having already known about the um, greenback dollar and the principle behind that, and that is the Treasury issuing and controlling debt-free interest-free money and not a private bank, when we approached them, we were told immediately, no, as far as they're concerned, the Bank of England must issue and control the money. Uh, and they saw absolutely, they didn't even want to debate about the fact that we have a perfect precedent of the Treasury issuing, controlling its own money with the Bradbury as things happened in 1914. And then when I raised the issue of how the central banking operation worked, uh, they were reluctant to even, well, they don't. They don't want to acknowledge the whole central banking system and how the Bank for International Settlement operates and how we know from eyewitness accounts that effectively the Bank for International Settlement is the mechanism by which the big, inter, well, the big banking families, the House of Rothschild, the Rockefellers, the Warburgs, and so forth, basically control the world's Money system, 95% of the world's GDP is controlled by the Bank for International Settlements. And it's an organization that hardly anybody knows about. Barely 1% of the British people have probably heard about it. And I'm afraid many of our elected representatives in Parliament don't know 
what the Bank for International Settlements does. So I'm, I'm very worried that when you have this uh, referendum in Switzerland, which is basically saying, yes, we must have our country issue and control its own money, the mechanism by which they want to see it done is through a central bank, which belongs to the Bank for International Settlements, which in turn, positive money, which created this network of countries who are now starting to ask for debt-free, interest-free money, they do not want to debate. I, I find it rather strange. I don't know what you think, Mike. Uh, well, in principle, I, I agree. I'm, I, I, as you know, challenged uh, positive money publicly on the UK column website over the uh, Bank of England issue, and they objected to that criticism uh, quite strongly. Um, but they didn't really answer the questions which I was raising. Um, so it is a debate that needs to be had, Justin, and I think uh, it'd be really nice if they would actually engage in a constructive way on it. This is the sad part. I'm endeavouring to be friendly and constructive because I want these people on our side. They've done a great job in exposing the fact that the private banks are creating money completely out of thin air as debt. And this is wrong. If we're going to have the liquidity for a happy and prosperous nation, we cannot have private banks uh, being in charge. So this has got to end. But I just don't quite understand why they believe the Bank of England is the right vehicle to do this when the Bank of England is riddled with secrecy. Uh, it, when, when, for instance, Mark Carney goes every six, every six weeks or so to a private meeting of around about 10 or 12 of the top central bankers, and, you know, this is all done in secret, so there'll be, I don't even know if minutes are taken, but the point is, whatever he is told to do by the banking families uh, or what they discuss themselves there at that meeting, does he report back to George Osborne in full and gives George Osborne a blow-by-blow -blow account? Do all his directors of the Bank of England know what was said at these meetings? Because one of them is a top union leader from uh, Unison who is obviously trying to, to, to fight against uh, austerity and so forth. So I, we just don't know. There is, it, we, everything is riddled with secrecy. And how can that be right when to have effective money creation and money supply, you want full accountability and you want full transparency? Yeah. Justin, thank you very much for um, that, that analysis of what was going on. Um, uh, Alex Thompson, who wasn't able to be with us today because he's uh, feeling a bit poorly, but uh, he's uh, made a comment for us that there's an excellent book on the Bank of International Settlements called The Tower of Basel. Yes, I yeah. uh, yeah. we will uh, encourage people to have a read of that. Um, I'd also just like to say that uh, it's our policy at the moment. Uh, UK Column would like people to be asking questions about the banking uh, system. Uh, because this brings the wider public on board. They're curious. They want to know what the answers to these questions are. Many people want to go straight for the jugular at the moment and brand every single banker as a criminal. Uh, is that the case? I personally don't think so. Yeah. But uh, what we are doing here is asking the penetrating questions, the answers to which bring the truth up to the surface. Um, Justin, we'll move on. We've got quite a few other items for the news. Uh, but yeah, thank you very fine. much. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining us. I'll, with, okay, cheers. With your bulldog. <laughs> uh, okay, well, the BBC is telling us it started. Here we go with yet another terrorist uh, uh, raid. Two held over Syria related terror offences, two men arrested in Warsaw. But um, there's no immediate threat to the public. But of course, all of the government prevent documentation is saying that we should be fearful of each other, we should be spying on each other, and uh, we should be very worried about what is due to take place. Um, well, the BBC not only whipping up the fear factor, Mike, but as uh, you were pointing out yesterday, it's pretty liberal with the truth particularly reporting about uh, Syria. What's your update? Well, let's just have a quick update on the day first. Uh, as we mentioned yesterday, food has started uh, going in and various tweets have been coming out telling us all what a great job is going on with uh, regard to the uh, trucks that are heading in. And of course, this, uh, this uh, image, this infographic that was sent out today uh, is saying 250 tonnes of food, which is enough for 40,000 people 
for one month. Now, if you look on uh, Wikipedia, that will tell you Medea has a population or had a population in 2004 of 9,000 people. Uh, when Vanessa was on with us on Friday, she was putting it at around 20,000 at the moment. Um, so clearly lots of food for lots of people ha has gone in there. And the question that we just want to continue to ask is um, who is now controlling that food and is it getting into people's mouths, which is the key point that uh, one of the key points that Vanessa was making on Friday, uh, that uh, a lot of the food was falling into the hands of uh, the so-called uh, uh, opposition, the armed opposition, uh, and, uh, and that in fact it was them that was putting the price the price is up beyond what people could afford. But anyway, um, as we uh, discussed yesterday, well, let's uh, talk about the BBC first because um, this uh, article was published a few days ago and I thought it was uh, quite ironic and timely. Um, how, is, how is citizen journalism transforming the BBC's newsroom practices? Maybe this gives us some enlightenment as to what, was, uh, uh, as to what happened with regard to the Medea uh, report that we talked about yesterday from the BBC. Uh, and this article uh, says user generated content. It's on, by the way, the RB blog, which is uh, all about the future of the BBC. It says uh, user generated content offers new ways of covering black hole stories such as the Syrian conflict. But how do journalists make sense of what is happening on the ground? While journalists do still report across parts of the country, uh, UGC, which is um, uh, citizen journalism effectively, is a vital storytelling tool particularly where there are no journalist boots on the ground. It could be footage of the aftermath of barrel bombing in Homs or the airstrikes in Idlib, uh, which was distributed by media activists at the end of last year. These individuals are no longer just citizens, but have become producers, uh, both users and producers. Uh, and identifying what can and should be used from these sources is a skill journalists have had to learn. All of these interviewed, all of those interviewed for the research said they had experienced a steep learning curve in de developing new practices and measures to ensure non-BBC content could go on air. These range from being proficient at verification processes using a variety of technologies and developing relationships with those providing the content. BBC journalists are frequently in contact with groups such as local coordinating committees across Syria, uh, the Sham News Network. Uh, many meetings began on Skype or with BBC journalists facing the owners of YouTube accounts who had uploaded content, in some cases via interaction on Facebook. Journalists are nonetheless conscious that some of those sharing content are doing so along political lines and may exaggerate reports of deaths or violence in a bid to highlight their cause. This raises questions of balance and it is for the BBC journalist along, using their learned skills to try to make sense of it all. And it goes on to say the media landscape has undoubtedly become more collaborative and interactive. The audience participation at all levels is now a consideration for journalists who harvest content from websites, tweet the audience directly and encourage contributions to their programmes. While one cannot generalise, it seems the relationship between BBC journalists and people within Syria has changed throughout the, the course of the conflict, with journalists in many, in many ways acting more like facilitators of news coming out of journalistic black hole. With the rise of the Islamic State and more producers than ever before, it looks likely that the BBC will have to continue developing these practices both in Syria and beyond. So if that's the case, if it's the case that the BBC is going to start using this user-generated content uh, uh, in, the, at, in a growing sense, then I think they pretty much need uh, to get a lot better at it. Uh, because as we highlighted yesterday, um, this uh, was one of the examples of where they absolutely got it wrong, either intentionally or not. I have no idea which it was. Uh, and uh, of course, I, just in passing, I'll mention that the BBC has now edited uh, this video clip to remove that young boy uh, from, the, uh, from the story. Needless to say, despite the email that I asked for comment, uh, no comment was forthcoming. Um, just Let's just remember that this young man... Uh, actually came from the uh, Yarmouk uh, refugee camp and was recorded in 2014 and was not in Medea at all uh, in uh, over the weekend when the BBC said he was. So um, what do you make of that, Brian? I mean, what we're seeing is the BBC 
talking about making use of more and more user created content, user generated content without, it seems, I mean, if people like us and Vanessa who are not professionals at this are able to validate uh, the content of BBC stories, surely they should be able to do a better job of it than they can, than they are. Uh, well, that's true, Mike, but um, I think there's something even more devious going on uh, with the BBC. And we have to bring people's minds back to our reports on BBC media action because the BBC's very own charity has been saying that they are the ones training citizens, citizen journalists. So the BBC goes into Egypt or Syria or Somalia or, or um, Syria, Libya. It trains people. It then coaches them to produce the very news that the BBC wanted in the first place. So I think what we're seeing in this BBC paper, I haven't read it myself, I'm only reacting to what you've uh, shown uh, us today, is the fact that uh, the BBC is setting up its own network of citizens journalists and they will be the ones producing the news as if they're independent, but of course they're trained and they're BBC stooges in the first in the very first place. Yeah. Uh, I may be being a bit cynical, but of course we can't trust the BBC. We've got another article here. This is Ixaro pointing out that uh, basically um, a police officer was leaking the identities of child abuse uh, survivors, which were then being passed through to the BBC for use in their panorama documentary, which uh, set out from the beginning to undermine the abuse survivors that had come forward to report what they'd suffered. And of course, the BBC was doing its best to protect politicians in the establishment from accusations that there were high level paedophile rings operating, particularly in, in, in and around Westminster. So uh, we decided, of course, to talk to the BBC. We gave them a call this morning. We spoke to Panorama's media team and asked them for comment. And what did they say in response to your query? We will not be commenting on this story. So Panorama, it would appear, using the leaked data of highly vulnerable people. And what were they using that data for to help close down investigations into paedophiles? Well, of course, BBC, not the only ones engaged in that a report from the church here. Uh, that a disgraced bishop, this is the former Bishop of Gloucester, who got away with numerous accusations of uh, sexual abuse before he was finally uh, uh, jailed. But what has now come to light is that the police who were investigating his crimes, um, running on from, I think, the late 1970s through into the early 1990s, uh, police who were investigating uh, were effectively told stop your investigations because if you carry on with this it may embarrass the church and the plan was to ship this man for um, uh, Christian work overseas um, as a solution. In, in fact the police backed off and then he stayed working in UK so absolute outrageous behaviour by the church and in reading this article my mind went back to the plight of Teresa Cooper now, I'm going to say that uh, I do not believe that we actually reported on this story when it broke uh, in January 2015. Um, this is the lady who, as a youngster, was put in a Church of England uh, children's home, Kendall House. That's the picture on screen, where along with particularly girls, but some boys were included as well, they were drugged unconscious for days at a time. And during the period that they were unconscious, they were raped and sexually abused by men who were invited in. It took uh, Teresa Cooper years of very, very hard work, often um, very stressful, not only her own memories, but pressures and threats put upon her as she tried to get the truth out about the abuse, her, or her own abuse and that of other people. And uh, one of the things that she had to talk about was that many of the women who gave birth later in their lives suffered birth defects as a result of the huge doses of drugs that were being used on girls in this Church of England home. Um, she succeeded in getting compensation for at least some of the victims, but the Church of England went out of its way in order to uh, close down this investigation. 
um, what better evidence can there be of a uh, high profile institution in this country, the Church of England, covering up on the abuse of youngsters? Uh, well, where can we go from there? We'll just uh, move on through. Uh, probably it's good to have a look at uh, Mr. Welby, head of the Church of England, and we pointed out he seemed a lot more comfortable hobnobbing with the very bankers who are causing the distress and economic harm in the world today. Uh, there he is, socialising with the great and the good. Um, but uh, we're getting deeper into what's been going on in the Church of England, aside from covering up the abuse of children. And we come to this man, Sandy Miller. Uh, we'll just link these things together. Apparently, he was the man who encouraged Mr. Welby uh, to go into the church, where he's risen to a position of immense power. Uh, this is all linked into the Holy Trinity Brompton Church in London. And the moment you go in that direction, of course, you're through to Nicky Gumbel, the man who created the Alpha Course, which uh, uh, UK Column will say, we think equates to common purpose for churches. Uh, but who is also connected with this group of people? Well, we've got connections with Tony Blair and his Faith Foundation. Uh, we've also got connections into the Christian socialist movement. Uh, what is that doing? Well, it says it's there for Christian principles, but in fact, the language is very political, the transformation of government and structures uh, certainly what none of these Christians are doing is uh, working out how they can help the youngsters not only abused by the Church of England itself, but other government institutions across the country. So a lot of research to be done. Uh, we have received some very fascinating emails from people over the last few days who are also concerned as to what's happening uh, at the higher levels of Lambeth Palace. Uh, if you are a researcher and uh, you'd like to get digging into the invasion of Christianity uh, with politics, we'd be great, very grateful for any uh, factual research you can provide us. Well, the Alpha Course of, uh, itself, based on um, Nicky Gumbel's little green book, uh, the Evening Standard had a really excellent article here which was pointing out that the Alpha Course seemed to be a creation for the very, very wealthy in the banking and hedge fund industry. And amongst other things, this article pointed out that Ken Costa, the chairman of Alpha's international arm, uh, a successful banker, rolls with Lazard's UBS, and he's also working with a private equity firm set up by a group of former Goldman Sachs employees. Of course, these are all the organisations which are going flat out to uh, feed the hungry worldwide and to help all the people in the so-called developing countries, I don't think. Well, it gets worse because, of course, remember that uh, our illustrious Prime Minister, David Our King Cameron, uh, not only brings the police out if people get a bit too excited about the need for food banks, uh, but this is the key thing, that he believes that his big society is a continuing part of Jesus' work. Uh, we think this is very, very dangerous uh, political rhetoric. Uh, David Cameron, it would appear, is in exactly the same camp as Tony Blair with his Faith Foundation. Uh, but let's just think about a political objective of big society is, according to David Cameron, part of the work of Jesus. Well, thank you very much to the person who took time from our report yesterday to get digging into FTAC. And they came up with this amazing document, which appears to be part of a, a much larger document. But this is the first time we've seen a detailed definition of uh, what X FTAC is about. It says it was established in the UK in 2006 to assess and manage the risk to dignitaries from isolated loners pursuing idiosyncratic requests or causes and fixated in its title refers to obsessional preoccupation with a person, place or cause. Now the meat of this is that uh, uh, we have a unit which incorporates psychiatric staff uh, working alongside police officers. So without you knowing anything is happening, somebody makes an accusation that you're suffering from mental illness, one of the so-called 
created illnesses that psychiatrists can now use from their book of spells. And in comes the uh, police FTAC unit to arrest you, section you, and presumably you disappear. Uh, this is not um, Stasi. This is not uh, the Soviet Union. This is not even North Korea. This is David Cameron's Britain in 2016. And we will say becoming increasingly dangerous by the day until enough of the public start to say no more. Well, we reminded people of uh, Theresa May's role in this, uh, a huge network of spying organisations, including GCHQ and a massive raft uh, around the cabinet office with links through to Israeli intelligence services and the so-called Applied Behavioural Psychology Unit. But as we've just seen from David Cameron's comment, that all of this spying outfit is actually buried within his so-called big society, which David Cameron seems to believe is part of the work of Jesus. I wonder whether FTAC should possibly be thinking about knocking on the door of our Prime Minister. Well, so that we don't forget, Common Purpose, who we've mentioned, are still at it. And here they are from their own website, busy training the Avon and Somerset Constabulary in how to act outside authority, act outside their silos, and to uh, work as future leaders to transform society into the common purpose mould. And of course, remember that it was common purpose uh, that was the organisation working very hard to bring in state control of the media. Um, but sorry, just uh, put that one back up, Brian, a second, because this is the uh, collab course, right? Which, which as well as all, all the things that you've mentioned, is also uh, dis organizing around the idea of collaboration and collaboration with other organizations. So, so this brings us back to the sort of uh, uh, the the group of organizations working together to cover each other, cover up each other's uh, wrongdoings. Isn't that what this is about, really? Well, it's always seemed to be the case with Common Purpose, wherever we've looked and we're looking at the misuse of public funds or, or the abuse of children or the failure to, uh, to get the police checks done on Common Purpose staff. Um, very dark organisation. Um, of course, um, roots in Demos as a Marxist organisation. Um, okay, so um, I wanted to highlight this article in Prospect, uh, on the Prospect website. Um, this is by Michael, Malcolm Rifkind, uh, and it's called EU Referendum, Will Cameron Be a Lame Duck Prime Minister? And he says, if Britain sides against Cameron in Europe, his authority will be shattered. Uh, when sometime this year the people of Britain cast their votes in the European referendum, they not only could change the whole course of British history, they could also bring David Cameron's residence, 10 Downing Street, to a sudden and dramatic end. Now, of course, at first glance, you think, uh, good stuff, let's uh, go for it. Um, but the question is, uh, what is this article really about? Um, I'll ask for your comments in a second, Brian, but, uh, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the notion that, that Cameron could be brought down if uh, he loses the referendum, is that a warning or is it a threat? Uh, it was probably a bit of both, I, I would say. Um, I, interesting that I think you said Rifkin is the man who's uh, that's right. who's come out with this statement. Of course, Rifkin disgraced as chairman of the Defence Intelligence Committee uh, over some matter with a Chinese company. But never mind, forget that, because clearly he's the man to believe about what's going to happen to the prime minister. Um, I think uh, David Cameron will certainly go and they will be very keen to bring in Theresa May, because as we've just pointed out, she is the powerhouse now driving the Stasi state. Um, but in a sense, of course, this is part of the EU referendum psyop, because uh, as Rifkin points out, uh, Cameron is going to organise for staying within the European Union. But of course, that only depends on whether he can uh, bring back um, a proper agreement uh, in February from between him and the other European leaders for the new uh, relationship between Britain and uh, Europe and of course what isn't being said in any of the British press but which we have been highlighting for months now is that uh, he may well come back with 
um, some kind of rhetoric that he can sell to people with regard to immigration or benefits uh, tourism. Uh, but on the other side of that coin will be the EU army, the EU treasury, the EU foreign office and further EU integration. Uh, further in EU integration, Mike, and a comment that's just come up in the chat box. Apparently the French have announced that they're very keen to mobilise 150,000 French teenagers. I believe that's about half the total number available. Uh, and these are going to be used as the community activists. This is exactly the same agenda uh, that Cameron has in his big society. And those um, teenagers in the sort of 15 to 19 year old bracket are the ones being put, put through the common purpose type training um, so that you have state citizens um, to help push through the rest of your agenda, spy on individuals, so-called anti-terrorist roles. Um, I think they are desperate to keep the European project together at the moment, which is why we're seeing the upping of the terrorist fear factor that enables you to bring in all these controls in the background. And as we're seeing, we've, we've got big society now emerging in Britain and France. Right. Moving on then. Uh, war, of course, because uh, as Justin uh, has hinted at with the continuing collapse of the financial system, uh, the issue of war becomes closer. Um, and uh, the latest sort of axis here has been this um, problem between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And of course, Saudi Arabia are massively suffering as a result of the oil price at the moment. Uh, they'd be del delighted to have another war that, that uh, would uh, um, help them uh, uh, sell some of their or get rid of some of their armaments and munitions and uh, help them uh, sell quite a bit more oil. But anyway, um, this is uh, Iran saying that they will not allow provocations from Saudi Arabia to derail efforts to regulate the Syrian crisis, according to uh, Sputnik here. Um, and they're saying that uh, uh, we are witnessing in the arena of regional developments, it's sorry, what we are witnessing in the uh, area, arena of regional developments is Saudi Arabia's agitating approach. Saudi Arabia intends to leave a negative impact on Syria's crisis through its escalating ac uh, actions. We will not allow Sa Saudi Arabia's tension-generating approaches to leave a negative impact on, on resolution of the Syrian crisis. But of course, it goes much beyond that because they're, uh, they're, although they're not directly attacking Iran at the moment, certainly on a political basis they are. Um, and uh, Sputnik also reporting that Russia is now forming three new military divis divisions in the western part of Russia. Uh, this is according to the Defence Minister, Sergei Shoigu, uh, and he said that they um, are going to build ranges, munition depots, and accommodation for troops in the western military di district. Uh, he said, I cannot help stopping at the most important task of forming three new divisions to the west. This is the most important task. Um, and again, Brian, this has got to be in response to the continued, con sorry, the continuing pressure that Russia feels uh, from NATO in the eastern States. Well, it's pressure and provocation, isn't it, uh, Mike? We've talked about this NATO running right up onto the uh, onto the Russian borders, and uh, inevitable that Russia would react. So if we uh, we pin it down, we've got warmongering by David Cameron consistently, and this is now having an effect with the terrorism and the way Russia's reacting. Um, and of course, it's not just Russia that's uh, feeling the pressure because China as well. Of course, uh, North Korea is being used as the proxy for this. And we mentioned the fact that after North Korea had uh, uh, experimented with their little mini uh, H-bomb uh, last week that uh, the United States had overflown South Korea uh, at, with alongside South Korean uh, aircraft. Um, and uh, that the South Koreans were uh, reporting themselves that this uh, aircraft uh, was carrying nuclear weapons at the time. Uh, now, uh, this report here from F World is pointing out that um, the commander, the, sorry, the commander of the combined South Korean U.S. forces, uh, who is Curtis Scaparotti, um, has ordered that U.S. forces there maintain the highest level readiness position. They're really trying to ramp up the tension uh, across the border. We've already seen the news reports uh, that they've uh, rebuilt uh, the. Um, huge tannoy system, which is uh, firing propaganda across uh, the uh, border at the North Koreans, um, and uh, according to the uh, according to this report, the European, the, sorry, the Korean Defense Ministry is sending more U.S. strategic forces into into uh, South Korea. Uh, they're trying to organize that, including B two bombers, nuclear parts, submarines, 
F two F twenty two stealth fighters. Um, so they're trying to really ramp up the militarization in South Korea, and of course, uh, North Korea isn't really the target of this. No, There's not well, much more to say. Not much more to say. Well, if um, if President Putin is creating three more divisions, uh, capacity bigger than the British Army is really what's going on there. Uh, let's have a look at what's happening to British armed forces. We have consistently warned of the attack on British. Uh, armed forces and part of that has been to destabilize them from the inside the herald here royal navy sailor accused of secretly filming sex in warship showers we've labeled it sun sea satanism and sex uh, because this is the reality of the military ministry of defense having improved approved satanism uh, is now trying to say well we didn't really approve it we don't really approve of it but in the meantime, we are seeing the effects. Um, clearly, this is this is um, orchestrated, Mike. This is not accidental. Uh, we've got a massive attack on veterans. We've got a big attack coming out on uh, inappropriate behaviour on the battlefield in Iraq and etc. Uh, I think they are really going to destabilise and destroy the British military, so we can create the European Army and Armed Forces. Uh, what are our local MPs doing? Well, here's Oliver Colville. Um, now, this is really fascinating. This is the man who has been promoting hedgehogs. Uh, we said, is he regressing to his childhood? But somebody else has got a different version, and I think there's some merit in this. Uh, we were contacted, and uh, our viewer said, um, uh, Mr. M <coughs> excuse me, Mr. Colville's campaign to save the hedgehog may not be as aimless as you think. Don't be surprised if next there is a campaign to classify it as an endangered species under Agenda 21. This classification would then allow government to collect fees, regulate landowners, which makes it very difficult and even impossible for people to live on their land. If anyone thinks that this is not possible, it is happening in the US, where even pests are being placed on the endangered species uh, list, such as the pocket gopher, a type of mole, followed by impossible regulations for landowners. UN Agenda 21 is absolutely being used for this all over the US. You will recall that the standoff at the Bundy Ranch in Nevada last year was in part precipitated by the US government declaring the desert tortoise an endangered species and there, thereby restricting their land use and cattle grazing. Now, this is a very, very interesting comment. Is Oliver Colville regressing to his childhood or is this man bringing in a rather more devious agenda? Uh, we will keep digging and we're encouraging our viewers and listeners to do the same. Well, if Oliver Colville is um, up to hedgehogs, uh, our other Plymouth Tory MP says that there needs to be a change to oversee veterans care. Apparently the government can't cope with this anymore. So we predict that Mr Mercer will be putting more power into the hands of unaccountable charities and non-government organisations. At the end of the day, the veterans will continue to suffer. Um, Economy, Mike's. This one has yes. po popped up here. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so, well, we've been warning and warning about this, haven't we? Uh, and finally, the Dilly Mill getting on to two million workers trapped in low school job, lo low skill jobs, highly qualified employees unable to find better roles because companies refuse to offer flexible working. And of course, the article itself diverts itself into uh, flexibility in working and part time working and all this kind of stuff. Um, the key point here is, is it not, the two million workers are, quotes, trapped in low-skilled jobs. Why do we have two million low-skilled jobs? Uh, why have we uh, abandoned any notion of uh, producing a skilled workforce? These are all rhetorical questions, of course, um, but uh, <clears throat> they're questions that need to be answered by uh, David Cameron and George Osborne, I believe. And this is reflected absolutely by Paul Craig Roberts, uh, in uh, a blog post that he made a couple of days ago uh, where he's analysing the most recent, what he calls, wonderful US jobs report uh, because, of course, uh, in December, uh, 292,000 new jobs were created, allegedly. Uh, 161,000 uh, were reported by the Labour Department to be uh, 
taken up by uh, Americans over 55 years old. Um, and uh, in many cases, these are second and third jobs. So how is this a good thing? Um, second, and th the people are requiring second and third jobs in order to make ends meet. Uh, and uh, um, younger workers, anybody from 16 to 45, according to Paul Craig, Craig Roberts, are having a worse time. Uh, workers in their 40s and 50s uh, suffered an, a large net loss of employment. And so it goes on. So really, on both sides of the Atlantic, we're seeing similar things. And as Paul Craig Roberts puts it, we're looking at non-tradable service jobs, which neither create goods or trade, nor are affected by it, and whose wages are low. Some 1.185 million fewer Americans were in the workforce in December than one year earlier, despite the fact that uh, the statistics, in inverted commas, claim that there were 200, uh, two or 300,000 extra jobs. So we're seeing the same thing, both sides of the Atlantic, absolute rubbish quality jobs. Um, we're both turning into nations of uh, shelf stackers and coffee servers, as we keep saying. Can we say might being turned into nations of uh, shelf stackers and coffee servers? Well, def only if we sit back and accept it, of course. Indeed. Uh, well, after some pretty heavy news, as always, um, the good news is that um, this is being built somewhere in Scotland, I think. Uh, Dundee. Uh, we thought we'd just post this up. Uh, people are beginning to look at the SNP and the rising police state in Scotland and grasp what's really going on. So we look forward to seeing the Sturgeon uh, Memorial statue, creative artwork uh, appearing in due course. It's pretty tall, that thing, I have to say, looking at the scale of the people in the bottom right of the picture. Um, we should be measuring it in feet and inches, though. Well, we'll end there. Dangerous times in UK. Many people are contacting at the moment to say they can see what's happening. They can see the political picture unfolding. They say, what can we do? Our answer remains the same. Get out there talking to your friends and family. Don't try and give, it, uh, give them all the picture at once. Give them part of the picture. Encourage people to research and start to bring our uh, MPs and local councillors, councillors in particular, to account as to what's happening. If you know any policemen and women, talk to them. Uh, court staff, spread the truth about what is really happening, uh, because the truth and exposure are the two edges of that sword. Can we stop it? We think so. It simply takes enough people to stand up and be counted. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back same time tomorrow. Bye bye.